Hi everyone, I'm Sandy Linnae. Welcome to Psychic Creations. We have an interesting show for you today. We will be on the location at the Washoe State Park and I will be giving a lecture on our book, Weird Haunted Virginia City. It will be a PowerPoint presentation. So please join in and enjoy the show. All right. Well, hi everyone. Welcome to the lecture. I am Sandy Lene and I am a Nevada author. And this is Arlene LaFerry. As you can see, she is a Nevada Historical Society docent and special works historian. Oops. That's okay. Training. <laughs> Arlene and I have written and are writing a series of what we call weird books. Weird Reno and Weird Carson City are the first volumes published in this series. Each book is filled with interesting facts, anecdotes, thrills and chills, trivia and fun, and enlightening bits and pieces of info. Actually, Weird Haunted Virginia City is written a bit differently, more soberly, than our other volumes. We wrote this special weird book because so much rich and important history from this town has been lost or forgotten thanks to our book that is no longer the case. Don't let the title deceive you though as it isn't a volume filled with cute ghost stories. Weird Haunted Virginia City is a book about the difficulties of living in a mining town. There are articles written within about the hardship, the despair, the lost hopes and dreams, and the death that surrounded this community on a daily, if not hourly, basis. This book is about the treacherous times that have left haunting impressions still seen and felt today in this historic town. But this book is also about the awesome history of the residents' lives, their homes, their businesses, careers, and jobs, and their day-to-day -day situations that most people today might never know about if it weren't for our book. And I thank Arlene a thousandfold for the remarkable research and exclusive personal files that went into writing this volume. We are proud to say that this book has an accumulated 35 plus years of research. I added a couple pieces of information. And it has over 50,000 pieces of information from <clears throat> documents, letters, articles, edicts, newspapers, certificates, ordinances, reports, interviews, records, license, and correspondences for just about every kind of communication and connection that there is. Now, I will expound on a few events written in this book for today's lecture with excerpts about the history enveloping this wild West community and the interesting happenings. Now, although I will speak of a few horrific <laughs> circumstances, I'll leave the many other shocking entries for your own reading pleasure. <laughs> All right. Now, the city of Virginia was founded in 1858. And during its heyday in the mid-1870s, the population was over 25,000. By the late 1870s, the mine's output declined, and so did the city's distinction start to wane. But during the 20 years of the Comstock's mining success, over $400 million of ore was extracted out of the mines. If you were to calculate that amount in today's value, the ore would be worth $9,333,596,409.02. Now, speaking of mines, 
Did you know that mules were used instead of horses to drive out the ore carts? The reason for this is, a horse will freak out if something touches their ears, such as the top of a tunnel. Mules, however, don't freak out because they just lower their heads. Smart guys they are. <laughs> Mary Jane Simpson was a highly important laborer in the Virginia City Mines. She was from the ancient and noble family of Andalusian asses. The miners named her and she was loved by everyone. Her permanent stall was deep in the mines. Her shift was from 3 to 11 p.m. and she never complained once because she had the greatest of care and the best food, even more so than the miners. <laughs> Working in the Belcher and Consolidated Mines, each day she transported 250 tons of ore to the mill. In her two years of servitude, Mary Jane Simpson hauled over $18 million of silver and gold out of the mines, and she never spent one penny of that fortune. Speaking of hauling things out, <laughs> we present to you the outhouse, where nature truly meets nature. I can't even begin to tell you how many deaths took place in an outhouse, and that includes falling in the hole never being found again. I will just say that when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. Soothsayers were a big business in Virginia City. I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I'm sure most everyone was interested in finding out if they were to become millionaires from the mines, from owning a business, or being a madam. One awesome psychic at the time was Eileen Bowers of Bowers Mansion fame. After losing her fortune when her husband died, she turned to her forte of fortune telling using a crystal ball that she called a peep stone. Known as a great Washo series, Eileen foretold of many correct events, including the Great Fire of 1875 that nearly destroyed all of Virginia City. Other noted Virginia City women were the ladies of the evening, who followed the mining camps around from region to region. After all, mining men needed something to do above ground after spending a long day, usually 10 hours, underground. Many fallen women lost their lives due to jealous lovers or disease and from opium use. Opium was prevalent in Virginia City and abused by most every courtesan just to get through each day. There were many suicides among these ladies using opium as their choice for death. A career in prostitution was quite hard on women. You can laugh at that. <laughs> All right. Now entertainment took on a different variety in old Virginia City such as a particular pharmacy that kept a man's heart in a jar of alcohol for the viewing pleasure of the community's residents. John Sullivan's heart was on display in July of 1875 at Cole's Drug Store. Those with a morbid curiosity would stop in to see the two bullet holes that killed him in his organ. And as a piece of trivia, Sullivan was actually buried without its heart. Sorry, you had another sentence. Uh, oh, oh, I did? Oh, I, oh, I did. I blocked mine out. Okay, Sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> now, explosions were a thing of fear on many people's minds in Virginia City, and explosions just didn't happen in the mines. They could happen right in the heart of the city. General Van Bockelen lived in a second floor room in a building in the middle of town and he was an agent for the Giant Powder Company. He happened to store six cans of nitroglycerin, 100 pounds of Giant Powder, and 200 pounds of black blasting powder under his bed. Well, the only thing that could happen did happen. 
on June 29, 1873, there was an explosion that horrifyingly and gruesomely blasted buildings and people to bits. Quite a few people were separated in the explosion. In fact, the remaining pieces of three females were buried all in one coffin. That explosion was monumental, I'll tell you. Now, did you know that women's clothing of that era could either save your life or cause your death? It's true. On February 10th, 1898, a 40 caliber revolver was used by Mr. Douglas to shoot Miss Gussie Melville. A bullet hit the gusset of Gussie's corset near her heart. The corset shattered, acting like a coat of mail, leaving only a superficial wound. <coughs> Douglas was arrested and Miss Melville recovered quite nicely. Miss Coran wasn't so lucky. On December 1st, 1869, while attempting to retrieve some water from a mill, the metal hoop of her skirt she was wearing got caught in the wheel shaft that led to the water barrel for the mill. <coughs> Excuse me. Two, the clothing over the metal hoop wound tightly around the wheel shaft and at each revolution of the wheel, the poor woman was whomped on the floor. Needless to say, due to a severe concussion and multiple broken bones, she died two hours after the accident. Sixteen-year-old newlywed Amelia McKay usually accompanied her husband to his job. He worked the night shift at the Gold and Curry Hoisting Works. On February 18, 1873, Amelia, at work with her hubby, went into the office to retrieve a book. When she returned, she walked next to the pumping machine. Her skirts got caught and she was pulled backwards into the space between the large spur wheel and the stone foundation upon which the machinery sits. Mrs. McKay was tightly wedged and all bones were crushed from her waist to her knees. She lived for five minutes after that. <clears throat> the Territorial Enterprise printed the entire gory story, taking a column after column after column. Most of the article is reprinted in Weird Haunted, Virginia City. This book is not for the squeamish. Now, speaking of newspapers, a word of sage advice comes now. Don't play with guns, especially cheaply made guns. Double especially when the locals knew local newspapers print everything that's going on. Father McGrath accidentally shot himself while examining and revolving the cylinder of a cheap self-cocking pistol of inferior make. The ball bullet entered into his chest. Headlines rang out in the afternoon edition of the Territorial Enterprise According to his physicians, the bullet wound will cause his death by the end of the day. It is interesting how the newspapers from that time period wrote every detail about an occurrence and predicted the future, which really wasn't that difficult to predict. As you can see, undertakers were much needed in western mining towns. So many accidents and killings happened. In the mines, from lawlessness, jealousy, insanity, drunkenness, all the usual maladies. Undertakers were quite busy. One very noted Virginia City undertaker was Colonel Joseph A. Convoy. He was known, however, not just for his undertaking duties and skills, but as an inventor. He patented the hand case Patent number 685754 on October 29, 1901. The hand case kept, kept rigor mortis from curling the fingers and with cotton stuffed inside, the hands were bleached to make them not look dead. As of 2015, when we were writing this book, 
Conboy's invention was up to the 111th patent of it, as surgeons use this device, updated of course, to this day. They use it for surgery on, well, keeping your hands straight. Now, do you know that for a while, coffins had no exact measurements? They were just built. If a particular body didn't fit, your bones were broken, so you could be stuffed in. It was common practice if a body was too long for a casket, the ankles were broken, and then the feet were laid back upon the legs. Yeah. <laughs> Many causes of deaths were not from shootings, accidents, killings, illness, and suicides. Nope. Falling off a horse, getting kicked by a horse, getting run over by a horse and carriage, or getting thrown out of a carriage due to the reckless speed of a spooked horse were stated on numerous corners. Did you know that Virginia City hated San Francisco with a burning passion? Yes, for many reasons, actually. But I will relay one very important reason here. The bones of Virginia City residents were shipped to San Francisco to be used at the sugar refinery. The bones might have had something to do with the separating process of the sugar. Either way, it was a horrible discretion of the deceased. Needless to say, the living Virginia Cityites were very displeased, and no matter how much they protested this blasphemous matter, it continued. Ghost haunting inspectors. Many people think that Virginia City is haunted. Many people just poo-poo it. Now, if you read our book to find out some very scary events that went on in the mines, in houses, and on the street, but as a teaser, if you stop at the St. Mary Louise Hospital, now known as the St. Mary's Heart Center, walk onto the front porch and ask Sister Xavier to appear and say hello. She did for me, and I have a phenomenal photo of her doing so. This is a dance. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you happen to shop inside the Comstock Bandito, look for the ghost of a golden retriever who sleeps in the back of the store. He loves kids, and children will actually tell their parents that a ghost dog came up and licked them. The looks on the parents' faces are priceless. Now, back to Weird Haunted Virginia City Bond. It might be best to leave the light on at night when you read our book. Ghosts aren't the only frightening thing that happened in Virginia City. Last but not least, our book also dispels some of the myths about certain events that are alleged to have occurred, such as dead bodies, usually minus caskets, were stacked up in layers and piles and backs of stores, alleyways, waiting for the spring thaw to be buried. That never happened. Why would any store, bar, or restaurant owner want a dead person in the back of their business rotting away? Embalming practices weren't the norm until the turn of the century. By then, Virginia City was its own ghost town. <laughs> was there another sentence that I forgot? Oh, there was another sentence. Okay. By then, Virginia City was becoming a ghost town. There it was. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. There was a special place for the dead. Read about that. Spe oh, this was, this was on my different, another page. That's why I goofed uh -huh. up. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> there was a special place for the dead. Read about that special place and where it was located in our weird haunted Virginia City book. Okay, now back we're back. Back to the saloon. <laughs> okay, now we're back. Okay. Now, the story about the millionaires club is quite comical. The organization was said to be held upstairs at the Washoe Club and was a gathering place for the wealthy. Much drinking and debauchery that only the rich could afford and afford to do was going on practically 24-7, according to the myths. 
Actually, the Millionaire Club was a ploy created by the then new owners of the building in the 1960s to provide a legal title to the upper section of the structure of this property. The owners even created a token for the Millionaire Club as a souvenir and celebration of owning this historic building. There's an awful lot of myths in poor Virginia City. All right. this lecture and additional interesting albeit ghastly <laughs> history surrounding Virginia City you can purchase my books at my website or I do have them uh, for sale here today. now these are the other weird volumes that we're, we're working on right now and we're not stopping at these these are just four that are being are in the works right now we have other titles that we're going to Thank you very much for attending this lecture. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Kim, very much for the invite. And the Department of Parks and Recreation, thank you for, for uh, this opportunity to have this lecture. Yay! Thank you so much. <laughs> cool. hope that you enjoyed the show. We're back in the studio again. Thank you so much for watching Psychic Creations. If you would like to be a guest speaker on my show, please contact me at my website, which is www.sandypsychicstones.com or at my email address, which is admin at sandypsychicstones.com. Please note that the content of Psychic Creations is of the spiritual, the paranormal, the metaphysical, and lectures. Thank you so much for watching Psychic Creations and we'll see you next show. <laughs>